Concerning spiritual gifts, my brothers and sisters, Paul says, I don't want you to be uninformed. This is gifted part two. I guess you could call it a sequel. This is a series that we're in. I'm very excited about this because I believe God's going to reveal some things to you about your own role in the family business, a.k.a. kingdom business. And when God gives us a spiritual gift and then uses us in the area of our gifting, man, there is no more passionate, purposeful uh, life or experience than that. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Let me say it again. Okay, when God uses you, okay, God will actually use us. You will, some, I mean, and when he does, and especially if it's an area of your gifting, it's just an incredible experience. And he is a calling on all believers' lives. And um, if you've already met Jesus and you haven't gone to heaven yet, and you're wondering, what's the delay? Like, what's God got me doing down here? Well, it's because he loves you, and he does have a specific purpose for your life, and he wants you on Team Jesus. Amen. Somebody say, give me a J. Give me a J. All right, you guys are here. I got to do a little review, um, a little review over last week just to set the foundation. Um, number one that we talked about last week, we talked about spiritual gifts are capacities that are imparted to Christians by the Holy Spirit to enable them to exceed the limitations of their humanity in order to serve others and to glorify God. Does that make sense? I know it's a mouthful, but it says a lot. There are capacities imparted by the Holy Spirit to help us exceed our everyday humanity. Why? To serve other people and to glorify God. Amen. We said last week that spiritual gifts are of a common origin, means all of them come from one spirit, the spirit of God. They're of common origin and for the common good. What's the common good? Well, it's to help people to know God and help to edify those who already do. It's a purpose. And we also said that gifts are... Not a sign of spiritual maturity. Now, this shocks people because sometimes we feel like we're trying to earn these gifts. And if we're better, if we could just do better, if we could just be more honest, if we could just pray more, just read our Bible more than maybe. But God says, no, no, that's not how it works. These are manifestation gifts where my Holy Spirit, I'm going to give them to you. You don't earn them. They're given. And it's tough to swallow sometimes because... Your character will take you places, or, or your gifting, I should say, will take you places that your character can't keep you, if that makes sense. So that's why we might see somebody who has this incredible gift of, I don't know, hospitality or of prophecy who could just speak right into your, look right into your eyes and read your mail and tell you something that you know is from God. And then they can somehow turn around and go, you know, get offended and cuss somebody out. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I'm just saying we're human. We're in our flesh, and there are, there is not a, um, it, they're just, they're given by God, and they're not earned. And so, a couple more things on that. A more, a more visible gift never makes one person more valuable than another. The Bible says that God's not a respecter of persons, meaning, I, I used to think that meant he didn't like, he didn't like us, you know, like he didn't think, and that's not what it means at all. It means he doesn't order people. He doesn't, he doesn't put Tom, you know, above Adam, but then, you know, Avery's down here, but Lucinda's, oh, he loves all his children. He died for the whole world. His will is that none should perish. And so um, those, the gifts that he may give to you, first of all, we recognize they're from him, but they don't make one person more important than another, especially, you know, those who have a more visible gift, like the, like the worship team. Like, we see them, and they're so gifted. That doesn't make them more important than a person that maybe is serving behind the scenes. You with me so far? Okay, uh, one more point of review, that every believer has at least one spiritual gift. Say, I got at least one. Everybody, at least one, probably more. Um, there are lists in 1 Corinthians 12 and Romans 12 and 1 Peter 4 and Ephesians 4. There are lists, and they are listed by Paul, and there's a little bit of overlap in those gifts. Um, now, personally, you read it for yourself, but I don't believe that Paul meant for those to be exhaustive lists. I believe he meant for those to be examples. Mm -hmm. Examples, because God is so multifaceted. What, we're going to capture everything that God's going to do through his people in 16 or 23 descriptive words no way so um i believe there there are lists that are meant to be examples not uh necessarily an exhaustive list god works in so many ways so uh number six this is just review spiritual gifts are given to help us love one another god said you can have 
all the gifts, and if you don't have love, you are nothing. It's not even worth anything, like a clinging symbol, ding, 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 like just an annoyance more than anything else. But um, the purpose is to love. He said, above all, love. Love conquers all. Love never fails. So that's the purpose of the gifts, and we should earnestly desire them. That was all stuff that we covered last week. We should earnestly desire the gifts. Paul said, I don't want you to be ignorant about certain things. And there are things mentioned in the Bible that we shouldn't be ignorant or uninformed about. And I see a lot of Christians being uninformed and ignorant about those very things. Like the very things. Like gifts. Some people gravitate towards them, seek them, desire them. Other people, I don't know, it's a little weird for me. I don't know, I'm just going to, you know, go do my own thing and leave that to the crazy Um He says, don't be ignorant. And don't be ignorant about end times. Israel, my heart for Israel, that was another thing. There's, there are things we're supposed to be, uh, have an understanding of. So when you ask a question like, what is my spiritual gift? Because I think all of us would probably want to know, right? What's mine? What's, what's mine? It's a good question. Um, it's a very important question. And unless you know the answer, you might never be 100% effective in your service for Jesus Christ. You might spend your life doing things in ministry, which maybe you weren't gifted by God to do. And so you might be frustrated and kind of not as effective as you might be. I think um, sports fans, we got sports fans in here? Okay, we got some sports fans. I think it's kind of like taking one of those big offensive linemen and putting him out at wide receiver. Um, you know what? The dude, can't, the dude can't run very fast. His hands are like bricks. He can't catch. But put him at left guard and he's in the zone because this dude was born to knock people on their butts and create a hole for the running back to come through. People thrive in different places. And in the same way, I know some people would, if you asked them to go door to door witnessing, they would throw up. I think there's people like that. They're not gifted in evangelism. Just not, it's not their um, jam. But you know what, put those same people over the finances and over, over record keeping, they're incredibly successful. And there, there are others, you know, because they have a gift of administration, let's say, instead of one of those other gifts. There are others who, who would, could never get up and teach a class, but they could lead a thriving small group because they have a, a pastoring, shepherding ministry, a gift of a different kind. Um, still others work behind the scenes, and they, there's a lot of people in here. There's some wonderful people that you never, you don't know what they're doing, but they do it so faithfully. They care for sick people. They just come alongside, or they pray, uh, they intercede. Maybe they bring meals over and comfort people who are hurting. They have a gift of mercy. Probably not administration. That might not be their gift. Um, by the way, people who have the gift of mercy are often really good encouragers also because they have such a heart for people, uh, at least one-on-one, -on -one, but don't ask them to speak in public necessarily because that m might have them break out in hives. <laughs> The very thought of certain things. You might have the gift of service. Now, that's a broad gift. What is service? Serving. Laying down your life for somebody else in some way, expending energy and, and time. And we have people that have, are so gifted. They're people who go, um, can, we, can we not debate all this stuff? Can we do something? Can we just do something? Can we just, whoops. Can we just roll up our sleeves so I can see the difference between what was and what is just by working? You guys can go debate, you know, uh, Ecclesiastes and, and Ephesians and uh, the 12 uh, disciplines or whatever. They just want to work, and they do it to the glory of God. Some people have, that's the gift of helps. There are people who thrive if they can come alongside. And thank God that there are people who have the gift of helps because there's some people who really need it. <laughs> We got a lot of ideas. Wow, we can light a fire and get something going. But without those with the gift of helps, we need help. And it doesn't go where it's supposed to go. So God just gives all his people, every person, Scripture says, he gives them all gift according to his wishes, according to his will, according to his timing, according to what he wants to do, according to, it's all according to him. Um, there's three general categories about gifts. We're going to get into these specifically more in the weeks to come. But one is serving. Just working to be a blessing to other people. It's a gift. 
Um, there are speaking gifts, which have to do with uh, teaching, exhortation, encouragement. There are some other gifts that have to do with speaking, spoken word. Um, there are supernatural gifts. Now, these are the most debatable, most exciting for some, most put offish for other people, scary for some people. The, you know, things like the discerning of spirits or uh, tongues or prophecy or word of knowledge, word of wisdom, um, miracle gifts. God gives them, and he apportions them at specific times, especially for specific situations. Some gifts are what they call residential. I like that word because it, it comes to live in you, and it, it's a companion. It's, it's, it's housed in you. God gives you something, and you actually carry that gift. Seems like you could do it anytime, anywhere, because you were born to it, because God gave you that gift, and it's just with you. It's a residential gift. That's one term. And other gifts are visited. They visit like vacation or something. They show up. They just show up, and you don't even know sometimes, but sometimes God has something he's trying to accomplish through you, and that gift will show up, and it might stick around a while. It might be for just that moment in time, or just that person, and, and it may not show up again until God says, you know, a year later or whenever. They're awesome. Gifts are so exciting. So number one, concerning spiritual gifts, the Holy Spirit is the gift. That's what you got to get. These are manifestation gifts. What manifests? The Holy Spirit comes in us through us. Amen. Someone say the Holy Spirit is a gift. Okay, let me give you some passages of scripture out of the book of Luke. Uh, one day when the crowds were being baptized, Jesus himself was baptized. That's exciting. He was praying. And what happened? He, the heavens opened. Oh, the heavens opened. The heavens opened. Sometimes you got to say like a word like, you know, like you, like you, you know what I mean? In, con, in the context of what is being said, they're getting baptized and the heavens opened up. The heavens opened up. And God had something to say when the heavens opened up. Luke 3, it says, and the Holy Spirit in bodily form. What did that look like? Well, it says he descended on him like a dove. He wasn't a dove, but he was like a dove, but he was in bodily form. I don't know, but the heavens opened up. What does that look like? You should want to know. When God says, uh, test me in this to see if I don't open up the windows of heaven. What? How big are those windows? Like, that's got to be big. What comes out? A lot. It says, um, he descended on him like a dove, and a voice from heaven said, you are my dearly loved son, and you bring me great joy. I can't even begin to try to speak like God. It's a comical. You are my beloved son. That's the announcement he had to make. You're my son. I love you, boy. I love you. Men, don't listen to the media. Don't listen to all this garbage that's on TV and all these shows. And every show is like drop kicking men to the curb like ladies don't need them and men don't have a role. And they're, they're goofy and, and dumb and, and don't see Barbie movie either. Don't see that movie. I'm sorry. But <laughs> my gosh, Ken, can we just do some G.I. Joe? <laughs> well, Barbie, Ken was made for Barbie. No, Barbie was made for Ken. <laughs> All right, back to the sermon. Luke 4.1, then, okay, so the heavens opened, the Holy Spirit in bodily form descended on Jesus. Then Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned, um, returned from the Jordan River. He was led by the Spirit in the wilderness. Okay, so Jesus had the Spirit descend on him. Now he's full of the Spirit. And he goes from the Jordan River. He says he was led by the Spirit. It descended on him. And then the, he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Famous scene. He was led. And this is, you know, this is, we'll stop you for a minute because God does not tempt. Okay? Some people, oh, God tempted me. No, God does not tempt. God does not tempt man. And uh, he's not a liar. But he led Jesus into the wilderness to be tested. He led him to be tested. And he was tempted, but not by God, by Satan. And it says that... Um, he was led by the Spirit in the wilderness, and Jesus returned. So after the 40 days in the desert, after uh, surviving unimaginable, a fast, you try fasting, no food, no water for 40 days. 40 minutes is rough for some people. <laughs> and at your weakest, and Jesus, and, and the devil comes to him and goes, make the rocks bread. I know you're hungry. Go ahead. You can do it if you are the Son of God. And uh, tells him all this other stuff. Anyway, filled with the Holy Spirit's power, he comes back to uh, Galilee. So, full of the Spirit, led by the Spirit, filled with the Holy Spirit's power. you got to get a picture of this. Step into the text. Reports about him spread quickly through the whole region. So, where does he go? He goes straight to the synagogue, where he had been brought up. 
This is a place they know Jesus. They know him. He's been going there for years. Interesting um, point of note, he's a rabbi, but in the culture back then, you had to be 30 years old to be able to read scripture as a rabbi in the synagogue. Jesus happened to be 30 years old when he went to the synagogue and did this first reading, and they gave him a scroll. They handed him the scroll to read, and in, as the practice was in those days, they would pick up reading wherever they had left off before. So they're just reading through the book of Isaiah. Jesus comes after all this stuff in the wilderness filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. It wasn't just on his shoulder like a little birdie. He's filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. And he comes into the synagogue. They hand him the scroll. And it happens to say, as he reads out loud, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Wow. He wrote the book. And it, who timed this? He, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to bring news to the poor. He has sent me, who? The God, my Father, the Holy Spirit has sent me to proclaim the captives will be released, that the blind will see, that the oppressed will be set free, and that the time of the Lord's favor has come. It's the power of the Holy Spirit that did all that. And we just read it, and they say, oh, yeah, I'm anointed. No, this is major. And it's because of the power of the Holy Spirit. And then in the Acts of the, uh, Acts of the Apostles, or the book of Acts, chapter 1, verse 8. Okay, Jesus' Spirit descended. It's on him. He's led by it. Now it's filled with it, in the power of it. And then he's talking to his disciples, and he says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Someone say me. Someone say me. Like it's you. He says, when it comes on you, and you will be my witnesses. This is a transference of power from on high. That's what happened here. You will be telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, Judea, Winchester, Menifee, Marietta, Temecula, San Diego, Samaria, Mexico, Honduras, Canada, Hawaii, Russia, the Philippines. Come on. Go, where? Ukraine. And to the ends of the earth. I think that is so exciting. Then it says on the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting in one place. And suddenly there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm. And it filled the house where they were sitting. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the gift. He's the gift. It's a manifestation. We get a little too caught up, in my opinion, in trying to figure out the label. Or trying to sit here and, you know, I mentioned first service, like, navel-gazing. I don't know, do I have the gifts of, um, you know, is this my gift? I'm trying to do this self-analysis. Just be an open vessel and do what God tells you to do. It's a good way to live. You don't have to, you know, is that word of wisdom or is that word of knowledge? Or was it knowledge filled with wisdom? Just be a vessel. That's what God wants from us. The Holy Spirit is a gift. I'm excited today. When, when people, because when people say the gifts of the Spirit don't exist or are no longer in operation, I, I'm thinking, what Bible are you reading? I mean, Jesus healed. Jesus saved. Jesus lifted up burdens. He, he healed. He did miracles. He encountered and evicted demonic spirits, kicked them way past the curb. The curb. And, and he had power over nature. And he, he loved people unconditionally. And he set them free. That's what Jesus did in my Bible, because I looked it up a lot, and it says right here that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Same God. Same God. He is still orchestrating. He is still healing. He is still speaking. He is still lifting burdens. He is still pulling people out of miry pits of clay. He's still changing their entire world and setting them on fire for the things of God because they got out of a situation by a supernatural intervention that they could never, ever have experienced but God, but for God. Um, he's still there even right now, even right now as we're, as we're in church. He's doing stuff. He's doing stuff right now. I don't see it. He's doing stuff. You don't have to see it. Do you see the wind? No, but you see the effects of it when it comes. You're going to see the effects. God's doing stuff right now. <sighs> We're the body of Christ. It's a transference of power. We're not supposed to live these lives of uh, no weapons, no fuel, impotent, uh, just no power, no, not, oh, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian, I think it's a better way of life. Are you kidding me? <laughs> it's a transference of power. Oh, man, my life has 
always been, since I met the Lord, I'm telling you, my life is supernatural. I, I'm not supernatural. I'm not saying I got something that you don't have. I'm not more important. But my relationship with God and my life with him, it's always been supernatural. I don't know. That's how I know it's God. I know me. I know where I stop. And he starts, thank God that he starts things and goes in a, oh gosh, one time, a long time ago, um, I was in an emergency room. I had hurt myself one of the many times. I'm in a wheelchair and I'm carting around, waiting my turn, impatient, and uh, trying to do wheelies in the wheelchair because both my knees were blown out at the same time. And um, my cousin Brad was with me and he's like, hey, you want to go take this call with me? It's a business thing. And I say, no, I can't. Why? I, I got to go talk to that girl. That girl? I go, yeah. He goes, well, what? I, I, I just, I just got to talk. I, got, I felt kind of funny. I didn't know her. She, she was sitting with an older lady. I assumed she was there because the older lady was in the emergency room because she wasn't old, but she was older, um, like older than the girl. The girl was probably like 19 years old or something. So I'm doing a couple laps, and I'm like, oh, Lord, really? You want me to say something? He's like, boy. <laughs> so I'm like, okay. And I, I think I did a couple laps. Passed her. Had to get the guts up, you know? I'm like, okay, this is going to be weird. I'm like, Lord, I'm like 40 years old. I'm gonna... Okay, excuse me. Um, I don't mean to interrupt. Um, I just, I know this is kind of like weird. I never do this, but I, I'm supposed to tell you something. I just need to tell you something. She just looks at me like this. She didn't look sick or sad or anything, but that's what God pointed out to me. And I said, okay, well, um, God wants me to tell you that he loves you. And you're going to make it, and you're going to be okay, and you're going to get through this. And that, I didn't really, that's it. That's all I got. And she, they, right then they said, um, such and such called her name. She goes through the door that's right here. The woman who was beside her was still sitting there. She grabs my arm. She says, thank you so much. And she just starts to cry. She goes, my daughter. She goes, she's been going through so much, and she's been talking about not wanting to be here anymore and not wanting to be even alive. And you know a mother's heart. She is weeping just profusely. And I'm like, whoa. I almost wanted to apologize, but I didn't want to apologize because obviously it was just one of those things. I'm not saying, oh, I got these gifts. I'm just saying you've got to obey the prompting because God's wanting to move from person to person, and he wants to, he wants to do things. Just last week, um, we have a friend, Lucinda and I have a, a good friend, and um, I don't know, Sunday morning, I'm usually like, I'm just in the Word, and I'm not trying to think about anything else, but something told me to pray for this woman and text her and tell her about it. And I'm like, now? You know, I've got to go to church. I go take care of business. And, and so I, I've said a prayer for her and, and texted. All it said was, morning prayers for you today. Um, she thumbed it up or thanked it. And the next day we spoke on the phone and she says, I really want to thank you. I go, oh, yeah, I just, I, I didn't know why. I just knew I was supposed to pray for you. And she goes, well, you know, yesterday was the one-year anniversary of my husband's death. And I was like, oh, my gosh. I mean, it wasn't on my radar at all. But God said to do God. something, and that's all. It's not like, I didn't think of that. Um, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. He wants to use all of us through different things. I could go on all day, and I won't, maybe. But um, <laughs> there's just so much. It's the story of our life. It's the story of the church. I feel so bad for people who don't know him, don't have a walk with God, haven't accepted him, haven't accepted him, and talked about him like he's actually in the room, because he is. Like he's sitting here. Uh, talk about him, you know, as a real person, you know. Oh, no, the man upstairs. No, this is God. God, the one who loves you, the one who died for you, the one who, if you pray, you will see things that you would never have seen before and you would never even connected it to anything because you didn't even pray. But when you pray and you interact with him on a daily basis, he will revolutionize your life and everything in it. Amen. I remember, Amen. Amen. Um, gosh, he, God talks to me all the time. He talks to me through music, s secular music sometimes because I love music. And I, as a... Uh, this happened this morning. I'll just tell you, it's kind of silly, but you, it's God, he's interested in the details, and he's a fun God, and he loves you, and he wants you to have a good time walking with him. So this morning in my quiet time, I'm looking over this message, and I'm like, I talk about the family business, and, and I, I told someone at the, at the coffee shop, Lord, I, I say, I'm sorry, I can't, I can't talk today. This one guy likes to talk a lot at the coffee shop, and I'm there for quiet time, so I go, hey. <laughs> and he go, okay, because he just... He's a lonely guy. So I, I'm just doing that. I said, sorry, I got to, you're going now? I got to I got to go take care of business. And, and I was thinking to the Lord because there were some things I just didn't want to miscommunicate. I wanted to say it right. And I, I said, Lord, is this, is this, you know, how you want it? And 
I'm an entrepreneur my whole life. I've been self-employed. And I used to love this song from the 70s called Taking Care of Business, you know? Taking care of business. You know the song. Oh, just boom. And I would play that sometimes in my old days when I, when I was, um, you know, just things were going well. Just So I get in the, the truck, and I was kind of just, Lord, I know I got to go now. Is this, is this okay? I, I have those talks with them. And I push on my my. Ignition and Sunday morning, if I have music on, it's praise music, it's worship music, you know. But you know what song came on? No. Taking care of business. Oh, today, I was like, yeah, Lord, and I sang it with him for like a half mile. Be glad you didn't hear it. But God is alive. The Holy Spirit's powerful. He's real. He wants to be in our lives. He's looking for a vessel. Um, is Janet here? Come here, Janet. Come on up real quick. Um, the, um, I'm like, come on. The, um, you know, the Lord, we just, uh, Janet said something this morning, and Janet is, I don't know, give her this. Green? Okay, green means go. Um, she said she had a, a word for, for somebody today, and she just, she's not one to ever want attention in any way. <laughs> she knows the Lord, and um, he impressed something on her heart that she wanted to share with the congregation, and... I think that you should share it, whatever it is. I don't even know. This was not planned. And like Pastor Brett said, I am not one to get up here. <laughs> um, but this morning when I came during worship, like we all do, we come and sometimes we're frustrated, sometimes we're irritated, and we may not even know why. Um, and as I was standing there and I was worshiping, um, I was trying to push past my frustration and my irritation. And immediately... I got a vision from God, and he showed me grass that was really, really tall. And um, he showed me that that frustration and that irritation is like the grass. And that when we are burdened with whatever we're burdened with, um, it could be pain, it could be suffering, it could be frustration, irritation, uh, anything that you're going through, that that is like the tall grass and that we must push through it. You have to push through it because as you push through it and you get past the grass, you get to Jesus and that you have to lay it down, even though it's hard and you think about it, whatever it is, it could be cancer. It could be, um, you just got into a fight with your husband or your wife, or it could just be for frustration or irritation and you have no reason or rhyme to it. And God showed me that those things are the enemy trying to prevent you from releasing those things so he can give you what you need. Um, you have to push past those things. So that's what I needed to share with you. This Thank you, Janet. Thank you. Let me just say, does that speak to anybody? Does that speak to anybody? Okay. There's a hand. There's more than one hand. So, so God has no problem getting messages out to his people. I shared another story this morning on our last worship night um, that we had out. I think it was the last one we had out in the outdoor sanctuary and uh, it was a wonderful nighttime worship concert called Holy Fire and we had some Holy Fire and um, a lot of people came and the worship team and Keanu and the gang were up there worshiping and um, people were using their gifts, the gifts of, of administration, putting it together and the gifts of, of helps and the gifts, uh, there was all the gifts going on, a lot of gifts happening including um, some people came and, and got some healing during worship and they got some healing that they did not have before and they did have when they walked away. Things happen and um, Carrie was here, Carrie Eller, if you know Carrie, she's tall, blonde and she, she paints, she's an artist, she's a um, just a wonderful uh, woman of God and we, someone had the idea, hey, what if we have her paint during worship just to, you know, just to honor God, just another form of expression. You can do everything to the glory of God, you guys. Forms of expression, whatever it is you do, do it to the glory of God. And she's got a gift to teach people art. And she, she actually had, uh, um, not long before, God put it on her heart to bless uh, the unborn, people that were still in the womb. Little, little babies and um, protect them, protect families from abortion. And she taught some classes where people learn how to paint. And she used her gift to teach these classes. She raised a whole bunch of money and gave it, just gave it to uh, our Birth Choice Center so that they could help promote um, the cause of life. And it was wonderful. So I need to tell you that because it relates to the story. So this, this uh, evening, she's, we're all getting ready to have this worship night, and Carrie was out in the lower yard over there, and she was just like looking up, 
looking up by herself. I could tell she was praying and talking to God, and I waited for an opening uh, so I didn't interrupt. I said, Carrie, what are you going to paint? She goes, I don't know, Pastor. I don't know. You guys, you don't know? I'm thinking, oh, no. She doesn't know. She doesn't know what she's going to paint. What are we doing? So music's going, and God, she goes, I'm, I know God's going to tell me. I mean, it's like starting in 10 minutes. And uh, I said, okay. Um, so worship's happening, and she's got the easel up in her table full of paint and brushes, and she just starts to paint. And the music is just beautiful, not showing off. It was off to the side, a little spotlight on it, but it was just one more form of worship. And she's painting this beautiful picture. It ends up being really colorful with a white bird just, just kind of like taking flight, and there's light behind it. It was magnificent. And um, at the end of the night, uh, a woman came by who, her name was Maria. She barely spoke English, but she asked her, she said, um, did you sell your paintings? And she said, sorry. <laughs> Did you sell your paintings? And, and Carrie said, no, I never have. But I mean, I guess we could. She said, well, I want to I bless you, but I need this painting. She said, why do you need this painting? No, this painting I must have because um, I've been praying for my niece. My niece is pregnant. And she has a little baby in her tummy. And I want to get something for the baby's room. And the baby's name is Paloma. And Carrie's like, oh, that's really nice. She goes, did you know what you painted? She's like, <laughs> she goes, no, it's a bird. She says, it's a Paloma. It's a certain kind of bird, a certain kind of dove in Spanish that Carrie had no idea. She's as white bread as, is there? <laughs> but, but she didn't know. But the lady had to have this one. And she blessed her, you know, the ministry financially. And it was a Paloma for her niece, Paloma, who was in the womb, which was Carrie's passion to begin with and why she wanted to do everything. That's how the Spirit of God works. Man, God is amazing. And by the way, Janet, thank you for coming up here because that takes guts. And I'm not asking for everybody to come and tell me every week that you got work. I just want to thank you for being brave and coming up and saying something. And I know that it spoke to somebody because that's what God does. Whew, man, I got to get going. Um, okay. It happens all the time, you guys. This church, oh, page after page, chapter after chapter, you know, we... we did not, <laughs> we didn't know when we started meeting, it wasn't to have a form of church. We, God gave us the property, and we didn't know what to do with it. We were uh, interviewing other ministries. Do you want to have a retreat center here? Do you want to, uh, you know, have a, a, a prayer center, or a healing center? You know, we're having them come out and pray. What's this property for? God, we don't know. I had been a pastor for a number of years, but I had stepped away from ministry. I had a, a bad neck, or, neck injury for a couple years and a kind of a life crisis, things I needed to address. So I had stepped away. And we were meeting because churches were shutting down, and we knew that wasn't right. So we just, friends, family, come over. Let's just have a worship. And, and then they said, well, can we do it next week? Oh, yeah. Like, can we do it next week, right? Can we do it next week? Five, six weeks in, my wife is upstairs. Lucinda's upstairs at the, at the um, kitchen sink looking out, and you can see out over everything. And, and she's not one to go around and say, well, God told me this, and thus saith the Lord, and this and that. That's very rare for her to go and broadcast something like that. But she told me, hey, now we hadn't been talking about starting a church. It hadn't even come up. She goes, I just heard, I, I, the Lord told me something. I said, well, what did he say? She said, he said it's time. And I said, you said it's time? And I, we hadn't talked, but I, I knew what she meant. I knew what she meant because I've been thinking, like, maybe we should do something. And someone else had said, you know, this is just like a little church, you know, after six weeks. And, um, and, and, then, and then, see, we, um, I know if God wants us to do something, he's going to speak to both of us. And usually me first because I'm running out ahead. But he spoke to her. And I'm like, Lord, this is what I think. And then who should come in same day, comes in out of the steps, out of the basement, comes walking in like she owns the place. Stand up, Melinda. You stand up. So she busts through the door, comes walking in the kitchen, both arms up. You guys, the Lord wants me to tell you something. I got two words for you. I got two words. We go, what? She goes, it's time. No discussion. And then some other stuff happened. Confirmation, confirmation. God does things. He doesn't have a problem getting messages to us. But we, I don't know what's our problem. We're like cut off. I don't know. I'm just, I'm not sure about those gifts. I'm not sure. It's whoa. Oh, man, we got to get out of ourselves. Um. 
He's alive. He's powerful. He's active. He's real. He's interested in you. He's watching you. If a, if a sparrow falls to the ground on the other side, he knows how much more is he not looking at you, Donna? How much more is he not looking at you, Brian? How much more? He, oh, we just, I think he's just so ready, you guys, to flow in our lives if we will get out of his way and be open. Be an open vessel. I better hurry. Um, that's a lot of stories. Okay. Uh, number two, ministry, what God does for us, in us, and through us. This is what it is. That's what ministry, it's what God does for us. That usually happens first because we're in a bad place and we needed something. And God will do it for us, oftentimes through another person. Someone who will speak and go, hey, God loves you. Or, hey, praying for you this morning. Or whatever it is, did something for me. All of a sudden, I'm lifted up. And now he's doing something in me. Because I'm changed now. My heart is for the Lord. And now he's going to do something through me. And the person who gives a message isn't the one that gets blessed. Or they are, actually. And so is the person who receives it and the people around. He wants to flow, you guys. And there's never been a more opportune time, a more important time in history than right now to live out your calling. And spiritual gifts have a lot to do with it. Jesus said, you're going to be my witnesses. John baptized you with water. But in a few days, see, what he said before he ascended, he said, you guys, you got to wait. Remember? He goes, you got to wait. And they must have been chomping to the bit. What are we going to do? He says, you got to wait. You got to wait. Power's coming. Power's coming. John baptized you with water. I'm going to baptize you with some holy fire in the Holy Spirit. And then you're going to be my witnesses all around the world. And ultimately, that's what ministry is. It's us being witnesses with our mouth, with our gifts, with whatever it is we have, with our whole life. It's speaking about the love of Christ and the power of Christ. It's, it's just, we're earthen vessels. It's testifying about him through our words and actions and allowing his spirit to work in us, for us, and through us. All of the above. You with me? Yes. All right. <sighs> On Team Jesus, we're not merely fans or followers. We participate. Okay? How many have been on a team at some point in your life? How many have been on a winning team? How many have been on a losing team? Uh, me too. Winning team's much better. I was when in grade school. I played baseball for years. I was on the Braves. Fifth, we had six teams. We took fifth every year. Last almost every year. I'm getting mad after three or four years. I'm like, it's got to be the coaches because because they get the same crop of random kids every year. Random kids. I mean, some of the same ones. But why do the Dodgers take first place every year? My cousin was on the Dodgers. He rubbed it in my face every single year. First place, first place. Braves, fifth place, fifth place. There's only one team behind us every year. Padres. And <laughs> anyway, what I want to tell you is if you're on Team Jesus, we got the best head coach in the whole world. The whole world, you guys. Um, if you read the end of the story, Team Jesus does all right. Yeah. Like, it's all good. Read the end if you haven't. See, it used to be Team Caesar. And back in Bible times, Caesar was large and in charge. And everything people had was, it had to go to Caesar. Name his faces on the money. I mean, money, talent, treasure. Everything went to Team Caesar. They would acknowledge him as their highest alliance. It's, Hail Caesar. They called him Lord. And then Jesus comes along and he goes, well, actually, um, you're not the Lord. I am. I came down from heaven. I created everything you see and, and even everything you don't see. So, so my kingdom is a lot bigger than your little empire. <laughs> now, that caused some trouble for Jesus. They brutalized him, crucified him, buried him in a grave. But you know the story. Three days later, he got up. He's like, I told you I was the Lord. Right? I told you. That's how we know that he's the Lord over everything. No one's ever done that one. And he did it. And now we all know who the Lord is. And there shouldn't be any question in your mind. Caesar, who was not Lord, killed Jesus, who is the Lord. He forgave sin. He conquered death and is alive forevermore. And it was at this point that Christians began calling out to Jesus as Lord. Lord and Savior. And if you're here and you're on Team Jesus, we gladly join our Christian predecessor, predecessors hailing Jesus as our Lord. Do we not? Yes. Someone say amen. amen. You know, just about every head coach has assistant coaches. And church staff are kind of like, uh, we're under shepherds, right? We're, I'm an under shepherd and we have under shepherds throughout this, this church. They're kind of like assistant coaches. We're there to equip the saints for the work of ministry. And saints are people who are saved. They're believers in Christ. And all saints are on the same team 
and we're not just spectators. If you're a Christian and you're not 100% sure of where you fit, well, that's part of the goal and prayer of this, of this series that we're in, to help you clarify your role and get on the field and keep you there. Um, there's a book written by a guy named Kyle Eidelman. I read it years ago. It was said, not a fan. Not a fan. I'm like, what is that all about? Christian book, not a fan. First chapter, I think it was, said, are you a fan or a follower? And so you read it and you go, oh, yeah, I see what you're saying. Fans, hey, give me a J. You know, I love Jesus. Right? But they don't really have any interaction with them. They're not really doing anything. They're just, they're just a fan. They just maybe go to the game and wave from a distance. So, but if you're a follower, now that's different. Fans do, you know, oh, they're rooting. But followers, they're invested. Followers go where he says go. They say, okay, he says go there. He says do this. I'm going to trust him. I'm going to do what he says. Now, I think we take it even farther than that. I say, well, fans are one thing. Followers are even better. But I couldn't think of a better word than player. <laughs> Sorry. But we're on the field is what I'm trying to say. Like, we don't just fan and follow. We're in it. We're in the game. We're going to be his vessels. We're not only going to go where he says, we're going to do what he says, and we're going to let his Holy Spirit flow through us. We're first string. We're team members, contributors, participants, created for good works. Because faith without works is, it's dead. Ephesians 4 speaks of Christ being the head of the body of the church. It says he makes the whole body fit together perfectly. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts to grow. So that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. Are you, are you with me? Okay, the whole body. Do you know that a, a bad tooth can stop a heart? It happens. Do you know that a, a, a toe, an infected toenail could eventually cause a leg to be amputated over something so little? A well-placed thumb on just the right nerve can cause someone to pass right out. It says every joint supplies, every person. Every cell has a function. Now, we don't covet, and we're not envious, and we don't strive. I want the gift that, that they have or that, you know, I want to be what John has, and I'm going to get. No, it's, it's you just be you. And you let God, God created you. He didn't create you to be like John or Selena. He created you to be you because he has a different assignment for you that only you can fulfill. And so when Jesus came to the synagogue, when we talked about it, and he said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me. Why? Uh, to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me. Why? To proclaim the captives will, that the captives will be released and that the blind are going to see again and that the oppressed will be set free and that the time of the Lord's favor has come. So if we're not merely fans or followers, we do exactly the same thing. Read the verse. We do the same thing we're supposed to. You with me? Okay, number four. Spiritual gifts analogy. I like this. This speaks to me. I think um, using your spiritual gifts is like going to work with your dad. Your father. My dad's a carpenter by trade. Uh, later a builder and a general contractor. And when I was little, he always had a pickup truck. Always, always had a ladder rack on it. Usually stuff in the back of the truck. Our garage smelled like a lumber mill. The radial arm saw, boards overhead, sawdust sometimes all over the place. It smelled like work. Smelled like wood. And he had work boots. And he had a gray lunchbox. I remember it very well. And... Uh, um, he had a gray thermos, the big ones that have a chrome lid on top. I thought it was so cool if you took off the lid and you could use it as a cup and you could pour coffee. Uh, that's the start of my addiction. And No, not really. I'm not, addi I'm not addicted. Um, but anyway, sometimes my dad would let me go to work with him. And I, sometimes I don't know why. Because he would, he would say, okay, son, I'm going to cut some boards. And you're going to pick up the scraps and sweep the, the sawdust and get some tools out of the truck and I'll, I'll tell you what to do. I'm going to start some nails and you know you can come back and finish them. And that didn't even work out very well. They would bend and, but um, it was great. And sometimes I remember thinking, man, he, it's a good thing I'm here. <laughs> got a lot of work to do. But <laughs> when I got older and I looked back and I go, wow, he, he didn't really need me. Like, didn't, I think I really, there's nothing I was doing that he couldn't do better. In fact, I probably cost him some time and money. Did he take me because he needed me or did he take me because he loved me? Because he loved me. Yeah, everything I did he could do better and faster. And uh, I know sometimes I probably cost him. Um, that's what spirit-filled ministry is all about. You show up. 
You just show up. You show up ready to be used. And you do what he says. And you contribute in your limited way. He set it up. I didn't even know where the job was. But he set it up. And he takes me there. And he tells me what to do. And if I mess up and I try to finish the nail that he started and it goes sideways and he comes back with a claw hammer, fixes my mess, and does it in two hits on his own. Take me ten. You know what I'm saying? You show up as a, as a ready vessel. I think that's what spiritual um, gifts is like. It's going to work with your dad. Show up ready to contribute. Number five, two divine directives. Don't be uninformed. Don't be ignorant. We've talked about that. And what Paul told Timothy, his protege, was be sober-minded always. Don't fall apart. Don't be crazy. Endure suffering because it's going to come. You're going to have some hardship, but I'm going to do something in you as you work your way through it. You endure it. Do the work of an evangelist and fulfill your ministry. With the, I'm putting the emphasis on your. Fulfill your ministry. Um, write that down. Then I'm going to pivot for the last point. Pivot just a little. It's about baptism. That was a pivot. Um, baptism has great significance. We are having baptisms next week, as you know. And it's a big deal. Please write that in. I don't know why there's so many Christians that have not been baptized. They love God, but they just haven't taken the plunge, so to speak. Jesus himself was baptized, and he was praying, and the heavens opened. The heavens opened. You remember that? I think the reason maybe that people, more people aren't, um, maybe they just don't understand that, that it's a big deal. I'm trying to make a big deal about it because it is a big deal. And maybe they've never heard it. Maybe they've been mistaught or they don't know, you know, the importance of it. It's incredibly important. Well, some people go, well, you know, I was baptized as an infant. I was too. It took me years to get baptized as an adult, even though I'd been walking with the Lord because I figured, well, I've done that. And, and then I, I learned, like, and I'm not disparaging anyone. I understand, you know, we, we, we're learning this. But um, it's supposed to follow conversion. So... In the Bible, you, when everyone got saved on the day of Pentecost, and they're like, well, what do we do? I mean, they got filled with the Holy Spirit. Peter, what do we do? And he said, repent and be baptized. So if you were baptized as an infant, as I was, you come to a point and you, you think, well, according to the New Testament, if you were not baptized by being immersed, that's, and that's the other thing. Sprinkling is another thing. In the Bible, everywhere I see they're submerged. And the word bautizo, it's a Greek word. And it's not even a religious word, believe it or not. It just means submerged. It means dunked. And, and if you read the verse we read earlier, Jesus came out of the water. So coming out of the water is the way it's done. So that's what we're modeling when we have our baptism. We're coming out of the water because we went down in the water. And it doesn't matter if, if you weren't baptized by immersion, following a personal decision, um, it doesn't matter if you're like baptized a hundred times as a baby or, or born in a lake. It's not the same. You need to be baptized following your conversion. So if you were baptized as a child, great. God bless everybody with all good intentions, but you, pro you proclaim your faith. And that's what we say when we're out there getting ready to have someone go under and come up. It's a step of obedience. And Jesus said, if you love me, what do you say? Do what? Keep. My yes, keep my commandments. And obedience is always a blessing. And delayed obedience is still disobedience. Thank you. Does that make sense? So, Jesus gave us two ordinances. He's like, I didn't tell you to do that much. Um, do this in memory of me, the body and the blood of Christ, the Eucharist, the Holy Eucharist, the sacrament. That's one ordinance. And get baptized. Because baptism illustrates in dramatic style the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. At the same time, it also illustrates our death to sin and new life headed for righteousness in Christ. Now, that's not a popular cultural concept, dying to sin. But we're not in it for public popularity, are we? No. We just want to be faithful to God. And so when you're submerged in water, it represents death to sin. Coming out of the water symbolizes a cleansed holy life, again, headed for righteousness. And baptism doesn't save anybody. Let's just be clear about that. It doesn't save anybody. It's just a step of obedience, important step of obedience. 
And, and if you need a proof text for why it doesn't save anybody, you can, the, the main proof text is the thieves on the cross. And one of them said to Jesus, hey, remember me when you get to paradise, when you get to heaven? He goes, hey, you're going to be with me today. Well, there's no record of the guy climbing down off the cross and going to get him baptized and then going back to be in heaven so that he could be saved. So it's not required for salvation, but it is commanded yes. us by Jesus. And um, I, I'm going to wrap this up here, but I just want to stress, if you haven't been baptized, get baptized. Jesus comes to the Jordan River. And God hasn't spoken for 400 years. And he says, I got something to say right now. And it's one of those rare verses where you get the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in the same verse. Jesus going down, the Holy Spirit descending on him, the Father speaking from heaven. And he says, I got something to say. He said, this is my Son. And I'm pleased with him. And what he was saying to Jesus is the same thing that he's saying to you and me today. You have a new identity, see? And there's something that you do in association with this identity. And baptism proclaims it. Here's your identity. You are unconditionally loved by me and nothing's ever going to change that. And we know there's an identity crisis of epic proportions everywhere you look. People don't know who they are in Christ. They don't know who they are without Christ. And even in Christ, they haven't quite figured it out. We're all trying to figure it out. But we need to overcome the identity crisis because when the devil attacks you, and he will, you know what he's going to come for? Your identity. Your identity. Just like in the wilderness when Jesus went there right after he was baptized and he doesn't eat or drink for 40 days. He's weak in the flesh. And the devil goes, why don't you just turn the rocks into bread and eat, boy? Eat. Or why don't you throw yourself off a cliff and let the angels catch you? taunting him in, su in a way, if you are the Son of God. That's what he said, if you are the Son of God. Fortunately, Jesus knew who he was, and it was kind of like, what do you mean if? Because you might not have been there in the Jordan River in the last chapter when I was there, because my father, my dad told me exactly who I was. He said, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased, and that's what he's trying to tell you guys. But we have to proclaim that as well. <sighs> i got to finish. You with me? It's important. Um... When you're single, okay, we're, it's 1225. Sorry, I'm going to finish. Thank you. Thank you. Listen, it's kind of like marriage. We're the bride of Christ, right? So the Bible calls us. And when you're single, raise your hand if you're single. Oh, okay, that's your identity. That is your identity. And you are single. There you go. Okay, but if you're not, you're single, that you're an individual. And when, then you get engaged. And when you get engaged, things change. Because now you have a new identity. You are promised, and you have a ring to prove it. You, are, um, you send out announcements to people, and you proclaim your allegiance, and you put former companions on blast that you are no longer available. No longer on the market. No longer. Don't call me. I'm promised. And you get married. And the two become one. And the identity changes. You know, he said vows before God and witnesses because you want God and witnesses to know your heart. And you say, I'm married. I'm in a new covenant relationship. And you invite people to the ceremony. And, and you, you have them come and celebrate a changed life. And you put on a ring that tells everybody about the life change that has taken place. It's permanent. And it costs a lot, too. <laughs> And it's symbolic, and there's no beginning and no end, and, and, and that's a little bit like marriage. There's no end. But when you're unsaved, I'm, I'm just trying to, no, I mean it in a good way. I love being married. Look, I can't get every word right, okay? I get a few words wrong. But what, no, I'm, I'm, we're newlyweds. We got 27 years of being newlyweds, and I love it. So, now, when, when you are unsaved, you're a sinner, and you know where you're headed? To hell. You're headed to a lake of fire. In case nobody told you, if you don't have Jesus in your heart, you are going to hell. No sense sugarcoating it. No say, oh, fire and brimstone. Look, I didn't write it. God wrote it. And that's what it says. You have Jesus, you get to go to heaven. You don't have Jesus, you don't get to go. You go to a place that God never made for you. He made it for somebody else. And you got seduced by the devil and the flesh and the world, and you're going to go there because you're too cool or whatever to have him in your heart. Anyway, when you're unsaved, that's where you're going, and you have an identity. But when you get saved, the identity changes, and um, you no longer belong to yourself. Just like a married person, they belong now to the spouse. When you are saved, you belong to Christ, and you don't care who knows it. 
And as an act of obedience, you're get baptized. If you love me, keep my commandments, repent and be baptized. You make the announcement, you proclaim your allegiance, you put the devil on blast that you are no longer available, that you are no longer on the market because I'm a child of God and nothing's going to keep me out of heaven. Since nothing's going to keep me out of heaven, nothing's going to keep me out of that water because my Lord and my Savior said, go get baptized. So you put on the ring of baptism. It tells everybody about the permanent life change that has taken place. So you better get baptized. Where's the clipboard? <laughs> we got a clipboard. Pass it around. Please, someone get the clipboard. Um, on the day of Pentecost, 3,000 people got saved. I told you this. They're filled with the Holy Spirit. What should we do? Repent and be baptized. What does it mean? It means I have decided. I have decided. Well, what else does it mean? It means I have an announcement to make that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and he runs my life. I belong to Jesus. I've made up my mind. I've committed my life. I'm not, I'm not even afraid to take some, un, some um, uncomfortable steps. Oh, someone might see you wet. We have robes. We're going to be very tasteful. You know, we have robes and, and things you can put on. And, you know, we're not trying to embarrass anybody. But God said, just do this simple thing. Just do it for me. Just do that. Um, I identify with Christ. My sins are buried. When I went under, that's symbolic. I went down dirty. I came up clean. And it's symbolic. I'm raised to new life. I'm resurrected. If you're a Christian and you have not been baptized, you're saved, but you are in disobedience. And there's no reason we should have a church full of people at 9 and 11 and go, baptisms next week. Well, I don't know if I'm going to do it. I don't know if I'm going to It's cold. <laughs> All right. Preach it. I'm trying. Um, if he saved you, why would you want to hold anything back from him, let alone something as easy and meaningful as jumping in the water and proclaiming your faith? Why would we hold that back from him? We've baptized 18 people, I think, in that pool since we've had it. And that's wonderful. I'm so happy. Um, yeah, uh, we, we um, I think we should do 18 more. Yeah. All right? So if you're in this place and you're not baptized, we're going to talk more about spiritual gifts next week, okay? I want you to know that's going to be a good series, but let's pray together, okay? I just want to say one more thing about baptisms. They're only for Christians. And being a Christian is by far, by far, someone say by far, the most important decision you'll ever make. If you haven't made it, but you feel God tugging at you, you feel God tugging at, tugging at your heart, poking you in the chest or wherever he pokes you, um, now's the time. The Bible says today is this the day of salvation. I, I was, I've read that and I'm like, like, what if I read it last week? Well, that was the day of salvation. What if I read it yesterday? Well, that was the day of salvation. Why? Because now's the time. God's saying, don't wait. If you're reading this now, now is the day of salvation. What if I don't read it till tomorrow? Well, then tomorrow is the day of salvation. What did you say, Lindy? It's time. That's the two words, baby. It's time. Sorry to, but it is time. Like, God wants nothing more than for you to be saved. You guys, it will erase all the, the junk. It might take a little while for some of the heavy stuff for you, know, to, for you to work through it, but he will forgive every rotten thing you've ever done. He'll help you to forgive everything rotten thing that was ever done to you. He'll give you purpose in this earth because he's going to let his Holy Spirit flow through you and help other people and edify you, and you get to be forever in paradise with him, with him, with him. The Holy Spirit's the gift. I'm Let's pray. 